Frankly, I think Australians are stark staring mad. This has got to be the most isolated place in the whole world. You'd have to sail 8,000 kilometres in that direction, and then you'd hit Africa. If you wanted to go to Sydney, you'd have to schlep 4,000 kilometres over that way through the desert. Why would you want to set up a colony here? You couldn't grow anything here. The local rock is that limestone which crumbles all the time, so you couldn't build anything. Everybody and everything got covered in sand. People were dropping like flies. In fact, it wasn't until they introduced the scum of the earth here, the convicts, that they at last had enough free labour to transform this place into the bustling, booming merchant port that it is today. Welcome to Fremantle. <laughs> So we're way out west in Fremantle. Frio to its mates. It's home to a relic of one of the state's bloodiest massacres. Can you stab that guy over there for me? We'll investigate the link between table tennis <laughs> and a working class martyr. And I'll do time in one of the country's oldest jails. We're telling about an escape that happened here in 1972. I'm starting my walk as I mean to end it, in the nick. And what a magnificent prison it was. This is, in fact, the oldest surviving building in Western Australia. It's called the Roundhouse, but it's not round at all. It's actually a dodecagon. Great word, that, isn't it? It means a 12-sided figure, like the size of an Australian 50-cent piece. And Looking at it here, you'd think this would be something you'd find in Renaissance Italy, not colonial Australia. The reason for that is that it was designed by an architect called Henry Reveille, who trained in Italy and gone on to be very successful in Europe and in South Africa. But then something had gone terribly wrong with his career. No one quite knows what, but he came out here for a new start. The reason that it's this extraordinary shape isn't just because it makes it look pretty, but it's a very efficient method of managing the prison population. It's called the panopticon method, which basically means you can see all the way round. And the warders used to stand in the middle and they could observe the prisoners in their cells all the way around here. It's a method of looking after prisoners that reached its zenith in the, the horrors at Port Arthur. Even though this is no longer a working prison, they still perform an extraordinary timekeeping ritual here. And it's one that started over a hundred years ago. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys. Welcome to the gun deck in the Roundhouse Precinct. At one o'clock every day, a very important person fired a cannon and lowered a time ball, so ships in port could check their chronometers were accurate. In the ship's log for the day, the captain would write, Fremantle, January the 14th, on the ball. And that's where that old saying, on the ball, comes from. Now, Tony, would you like to come up and be our honorary gunnery officer today? Yes, I'd love to. Now, we have the firing mechanism here, and when the red light comes on, it's armed and ready to go. Yeah. OK, everybody, let's start the countdown now. Three, two, one, bang! That was some sound! My ears are really ringing! Wow, I didn't expect it to be as loud as that. Ooh. I did warn you it was loud. <laughs> so let's give Tony a clap. If I could hear the applause, I'd be really satisfied. <laughs> you can't hear a thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. My walk's taking me down to Fishing Boat Harbour. I'm not the sort of bloke who usually hangs out down by the docks, but here in Fremantle, you'll meet a nicer class of person. Taller, too. John, ports the world over tends to be a bit rough, don't they? Is that true of Fremantle? Yes, through the, uh, the 20th century when the fishing industry developed, um, 
particularly in the uh, 50s and 60s when all the Italians came here after the war. You know, very much a wild, hurly-burly, rough town. I mean, there's certainly bits of Frio you wouldn't want to go to in those days. But then, in the 1980s, almost overnight, it seemed to me, yeah. Fremantle was transformed by the America's Cup, which is just a boat race after all, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely, and that's quite true. Australia was in the middle of a bit of a recession, um, and we'd beaten the Americans in one of their dual sports. So suddenly you were the focus of the whole yachting world. Is, is oh, that when all this sort of stuff happened? Ab absolutely. The America's Cup gave us this massive injection. But that kind of energy, that kind of excitement, doesn't seem to have faded away. No, I think what happened is that the America's Cup started the party, and the party's never really stopped. <laughs> John, in the 70s, the developers pretty much flattened Perth, didn't they? But the same sort of thing didn't seem to happen here. Yeah, it all happened up in Perth. Uh, Frio was the grotty little port that, you know, was sort of left alone. And uh, it really wasn't until the late 60s, early 70s, that they started to turn their eyes on us. And, uh, and uh, the Fremantle people rose up, you know. They said, hey, hang on, you know, we're, we're not a part of Perth. This is, we're a separate place, and we sort of like the city like it is. And uh, this great battle uh, sort of raged over a number of years. And did the forces of good win, do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. We managed to preserve a cityscape that is really quite unique within Australia. You know, this is um, a typical Australian 1890s, 1910 city. It's funny, you talk about Fremantle as distinct from Perth, but a lot of people would say, well, it's just a suburb of Perth. It certainly is not. It's, uh, it is its own place, and Fremantle people, Perth people, they're absolutely poles apart. No way are we a suburb of that other place up the river. I'm glad he clarified that for me. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, John, thanks a lot. Oh, it's been great. I'll never say that you're a suburb of Perth ever again. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> Nice walk so far, isn't it? Right. Time for murder and mayhem at the nearby Maritime Museum. It's a bloodthirsty yarn that dates back to 1629. And I love it. A state-of-the-art ship called the Batavia left Holland, crowded with people, in order to buy spices in the East Indies. But a wind blew up, she was blown off course, and she foundered on a reef about 450 kilometres from here. And they've got a piece of the ship right here in this room. Isn't that fantastic? The rest of the story was so horrific and so bloody that... I've got to tell you, haven't I? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we want to retell the story of what happened to the passengers and crew of the Batavia uh, after it had become grounded. Would you mind helping me act this out? That's very kind of you. OK, right. Well, this is day one, all right? Yeah, and you're all staggering around. There's about 300 people, dazed and confused. The very first thing that happened was that the captain, who was a very brave man, I'll choose you because you're the tallest, how do you do? He decided that with a few of his men, he would row in an open boat to present-day Jakarta, which was over 30 days away. Really tremendously scary thing to do. So off you go, off to Jakarta. Jakarta's over there by the, the fire exit, which meant that they were left without a leader. But there was a nutter there, a fanatic, called Geronimus, who I'm going to play because I like playing the baddie. Uh, <laughs> and he just took control of the situation. And he ordered the troops who were on board to go off and forage for food, firewood, that sort of thing. Who's going to be the troops? Troops, all right. Can you go to this island, uh, see what you can find, just over there? And as soon as they were there, he nicked the boat. So they are now marooned, and presumably they're going to die. And then he chose some of the younger passengers. Will you two be the younger passengers? Um, uh, they became his police, his enforcers, and he dressed them up in gold and red uniforms. And they started picking on the rest of the passengers. Uh, you, we don't like the look of you. Can you kill that passenger? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> And very soon, he didn't need any kind of excuse, just anybody he wanted to, he would order to be killed. They were throttled, they were stabbed. Men, women, children, 125 people. It was absolutely horrific. A few of them escaped. Who's going to escape? 
Right, OK. Uh, and they went off to the island and they warned the troops about what was happening and the troops threw up a stockade made out of driftwood. This is actually one of the cannons off the Batavia, so you can use that if you like. And uh, Geronimus's men uh, attacked the fort and they were thrown back and then they attacked it again and were thrown back again and they were just about to overwhelm the troops when what happened? Who should come back but our hero, the captain? Come on, back! <laughs> and this is the rescue boat, right, all the way from Jakarta, and the troops tried to tell him what was happening, and Geronimus's men tried to tell him what was happening, and he realised that Geronimus's men were absolutely evil, and put out your hands. They hacked off their hands with a chisel and a mallet, and then they executed them. And now... Everybody could go back to Jakarta. Hooray! Except for just two people. There was a sailor and a cabin boy who were considered not quite as culpable uh, as Geronimus's men. Uh, and so they weren't executed, they were just abandoned and were never heard of again. So off you go. <laughs> Except that a few years later, some of the colonists started saying, that many of the Aboriginals around here were very fair-skinned and they believe that they were the direct descendants of the sailor and the cabin boy. Thank you very much. Thanks for your help. <laughs> Bye. By the early 1850s, Australia's eastern colonies were done with convicts. Handy, really, because Fremantle couldn't get enough of them. The free settlers thought they'd be perfect for doing all the dirty work and, as a bonus, providing a thriving economy. So when the next money-spinning opportunity came along, Fremantle was perfectly positioned to take advantage of it. And what was that opportunity? Gold. In the late 1880s, it was discovered in Western Australia, and that led to the third Australian gold rush. By that time, places like Melbourne and Brisbane were suffering from terrible recessions, so people flooded here from the east. Between 1888 and 1901, Fremantle trebled in size. And what was the result of all this gold money? Swanky buildings like these. No, it's a mini Melbourne, isn't it? Which, by the way, is the sort of thing you shouldn't say around here. I'm not saying they're parochial, but just don't, all right? Anyway, this spot looks nice. Fremantle is the only town in Western Australia that's got its own formal city square, complete with its lovely public table tennis tables, of course. But the only problem is that the city itself developed over there in <laughs> that direction. So you've got this city square, which hardly anyone ever uses, 2117. But the other interesting thing about this square, apart from the incredible athletes that you meet here, is this fountain, this bubbler, which says it was erected to the memory of Comrade Tom Edwards, working-class martyr who sacrificed his life on the Fremantle Wharf. And in order to tell that story, I'm going to go to the wharf. Tom Edwards was a lumper. Sounds painful, I know, but that's Fremantle speak for a dock worker. From early last century, this was a hugely successful international port, but the lumpers did it tough. Shifts weren't guaranteed, and when they got them, they could last 48 hours at a stretch. So the lumpers got organised. They'd go on strike, and as soon as they did, the employers would bus in a whole load of scabs who would unload the boats for them. And it was these terrible industrial relations which led directly to the bloody Sunday riots of the year 1919. There was a ship out there called SS Dimbula, which the lumpers refused to unload. So as normal, the scabs came in, but this time they were strong-armed off the dock and a three-week standoff occurred. 
But the Premier of Western Australia, whose name was Hal Colbatch, refused to take this lying down. And he got his police to take up arms, and then they ran barricades across the streets so that the lumpers couldn't get at the scabs. And then the scabs came in launches with Hal Colbatch at their head. But as soon as they got to land, a massive crowd appeared of people in Fremantle who supported the lumpers. As soon as the scabs put one foot on shore, this massive battle occurred. There were rocks flying through the air, big lumps of metal, and it was at that moment that Tom Edwards received a cut in the head from a rifle and collapsed on the ground. At that moment, the crowd saw sense, and the scabs were ordered to leave, and the lumpers said they'd go home, and order was restored. Three days later, Tom Edwards died. Thousands of people lined the streets of Fremantle to watch his funeral cortege go by. The Lumpers had a hero and a martyr. So was his sacrifice worth it? Well, in a way, it was. From then on, scab labour was banned from the wharves, and a week after the funeral, Premier Colbatch resigned, making his premiership the shortest in the state's history. Mind you, he did get a knighthood eight years later. This is Fremantle, home to colonial clockers, mutinous murderers and legendary lumpers. What next? Well, I'm hitting the city's cappuccino strip to find out how it all started. Excuse me, ladies, can I muscle in? Do you have any idea how cafe culture started along this strip? No, we have no idea. Do you remember a guy called Nuncio Domina? Remember the name? We do know him. Well, we used to come here a lot. Yeah. Right. Well, do you remember that in the old days, you couldn't eat here because the council said nobody could eat outside because it would attract the flies? Yeah. Nuncio didn't care. He just shoved out his table and his chairs. But then he had to get round the licensing authorities. So what he did was institute his thing called the Three Beans. You remember that? Yes. And you'd order a Three Beans. And what else was in it? Can't remember. Sambuca. <laughs> oh, exactly. Oh, yes. God. And because the authorities never busted him for that, it created a precedent. Yes, yes. And that tiny little beginning, those Three Beans, led to all this. this. Yeah, yeah. Aren't we lucky? Yeah. Have a good afternoon. We will. Enjoy Thank your you very sesh. Much. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> See ya. And that was, um, all the guys used to order a Zambuca after the meal. Yes. <laughs> well, I've finished my stint on the strip. Now it's time. Hang, hang, hang on. Look at this. Isn't it extraordinary? It just goes on and on and on and on. It's most delicate piece of street art I think I've seen in the whole of Australia. Excuse me, is this your work? Oh, hello. Um, yeah, it's my work. Um, but being street art, it's everybody's work. Uh, yeah, I don't see what you mean. It is in a way, but well, what does it represent? Oh, that my personal motto, do justice to your talent. If you've got a talent and you're not doing justice to it, where are you? Well, you're certainly doing justice to your talent. I think it's thank you. really tasty work. Well done. Thank you, my friend. And thank you. For a small town, this place does very nicely for jails. Fremantle Prison isn't far from the Roundhouse, and as it's my last stop, I thought I'd spend a bit of time here. Well, it's what you do in prison, isn't it? There are about 520 cells here, but one is very different from the others. It was occupied by a bloke called Walsh, and after he left, it became a store cub and, and stayed pretty much the same for 100 years. And then one day, a cleaner was cleaning away at the plaster, and a little bit fell off, and a drawing was revealed. Actually, we're not going to both be able to get in here. You go in first, and... I'll talk you through. Go in and turn left. 
Can you see that frieze there? It's like it's something that you might find on a Greek or Roman building, isn't it? Drawings go all the way around. That one there, that dark one. Now, these were created with lead and little fine brushes, although where he got the lead and brushes from, I've no idea. And this one here, this is fairly obvious. That is St John the Divine on the Greek island of Patmos. And you can tell that. Can you see he's writing on a parchment? And below that, there's this rolled up manuscript. That would be the book of Revelation that he wrote on Patmos. And down here, you've got Walsh himself when he was a little boy praying to God. It's rather cute. And this one is magnificent. What I find so extraordinary about this stuff is that presumably he didn't have any books to copy from, so all of these were coming from his head. So elaborate, so well executed. But come out now, come on, we're all getting a bit claustrophobic. What intrigues me is why on earth did he do all these drawings? There's a theory that he did them in order to sort of suck up to the warders, that they'd think he was not only a really good artist, but that he'd become a, a real born-again Christian and deserved to be let free. I don't know whether that's true or not, but what we do know is that once he got out, he never went inside again. In fact, he became a colonial artist. So you see, prison works. <laughs> Bang them up, I say. I've heard a few prison escape stories in my time, but never one that involves an electronics whiz, a phone made of spare parts, and a rather gullible guard. Luke, it's 1972. Tell me all about the great prank call escape. OK, so there was a man called Owen Hooper, and he was in, he was a radio technician, and um, he had two friends, one called William Cabolt and another one called Stanley Stone. And those three guys ran the radio station, the prison radio station, from the corner cell of New Division here. So they were DJs, really, weren't they? Yeah, that's right. And they, they played music for the prisoners. Prisoners could request their favourite songs and so on. Owen Hooper was a very, very smart guy, and the prison officials asked him to help with electronic repairs around the site. This was a terrible mistake on their part. Yes, exactly <laughs> right, because what, what he did was they asked him to fix up a telephone line in the hospital yeah. in the corner up here. And when he did that, he also somehow managed to run a line down to his uh, radio cell in New Division. Yeah. And tapping into that telephone line, he was able to make phone calls outside the prison. Right, right. So now we come to the night in question. OK, so on the night, they broke up through the ceiling of their cell yeah. into about a two-foot ceiling space between the ceiling and the roof. So this is right where we can see now, along this, this green guttering yeah. here. That's right. And so they, they crawled along through this ceiling space yeah. to this point here, and then they punched a hole up through the roof, and they climbed out onto the top here. So now they're stuck in the corner of the roof, and they've got to get onto this wall. Yeah. How did they do that? They had to distract the guard who was up in the gun tower on the corner of the prison complex up here. Which is much further away than this little hut here. That's right. So, so Owen Hooper, he had a field phone. He used his field phone to tap into the prison phone line and he called the guard in this gun tower. Pretending to be a prison officer. That's right. And he said, he said, um, the, he said gate, gate officer here, I've seen suspicious activity down in the southern area of the prison. Could you keep an eye on it for me for a few moments? So the bloke on the wall starts looking in that direction. He obligingly looks down that way, and then while he's distracted, these three guys, they had made a ladder out of pipes and metal hooks. And, and telephone, telephone cables. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And they flipped it down onto the top of the perimeter wall here. Yeah shimmied across. Which must have been incredibly dangerous. Yes, you'd think so. And, and it's a long, it's a nine metre drop down yeah. to the bottom. And they ran a line, a rope down to the road. Oh, we're telling about an escape that happened here in 1972. Just where you are now, there was the getaway car. Except it was a woman, not a bloke. <laughs> See ya. Cheers. Yeah, and you're right, there was a getaway car waiting for them. They jumped into the car and off they went. The only problem was, though, they were caught again three months later. So, brilliant escape, but really all that hard work was wasted, rather, wasn't it? Absolutely. Superb story. Cheers. You're welcome. Ta da.
And that's what half a day's walk has to offer in Fremantle. A city that very definitely isn't just another suburb of Perth. What really intrigues me so much about Fremantle is that throughout its life, it's constantly reinvented itself. Originally, it was a free town, then it became a convict town, a gold town, an international port, and today, it's a leisure hub, complete with cafes and restaurants and a big wheel so you can see the view. Just one ticket, please. Thanks. And what will it be like in 25 years' time? Well, I haven't a clue. But what I am sure of is that whatever it is, it'll be quintessentially Fremantle. And now I'm going for a ride. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.